Hey everybody, the March 2022 Roundup is brought to you by Fun Again Games. And hello folks, welcome back. It is that time of the month when I sit down and tell you all about all the games my wife Jen and I played over the preceding four weeks. And I've got a bunch of games to talk about. But it is not just me anymore. Um, Shay will be talking about some games, including games that he was just playing for fun that didn't even show up on the channel. Uh, but he was so passionate he wanted to talk about them. Ryan covered a bunch of new rules videos. And the newest contributor to the channel, Kim, did another run through as well. So first, you're going to hear from all the contributors, then you'll hear about Jen's and my games. But before we get to that, um, on the last roundup, uh, Jen actually got on uh, screen and sat down and talked to everybody about what she was doing to try to raise funds for the people of Ukraine, um, you know, who are in the middle of a war zone right now. And she committed to um, 100% of her profits from a wonderful, adorable new line of game pieces she makes. Um, let's see if we can put them on screen. Uh, she was she started making these in the Ukrainian flag colors, blue and yellow. She has now gotten orders. I think. Uh, oh, 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 I forget. It's like over 400, no, over 200 orders, and she has to make over 350 of them, which is like well over a year's worth of work for her. She is working night and day, um, banging these out, every one of them unique, and um, 100% of the profits goes towards to care.org. And she just announced today that um, she's had to close taking more orders because she just can't take any more. She's only one woman. Um, but she has raised over $10,000. And with matching funds, we have actually ended up donating to various um, Ukrainian relief causes over $20,000. And I just wanted to take a second to say thank you, everybody out there who helped. Either if you, know, if you were able to buy some, or even if you just shared um, you know, to try to drum up support for it. I mean, there's just such an outpouring of love from Board Game Geekdom. It's just absolutely amazing. And before we move on, um, while Jen is not taking any more orders, there is still one last way to pick up four more of these a little Witwat, and they are on um, auction right now on the Jack Vassal Memorial Fund auction. This is something that the Dice Tower runs every year to raise funds to help gamers in need in their darkest hour. Uh, Jen and I have been you know, donating our time and resources for years uh, to try to raise more funds for the Jack Vassal. And if you f go follow the link at the bottom of the screen, http colon slash slash jv for jackvassal.rado.com, you will go to my entry on the auction where you can get four more, the last four of these that Jen is going to make. She's going to make a special set, and they will go to one lucky winner of that auction. Plus, that um, winner will also end up getting four sets of the uh, Rado Runs Through Everdell cards. And um, and then you'll also get to make me run through some games that you want to see, too. So, uh, definitely, if you've got the... Uh the, you know, the, the inclination, go to jv.rado.com, check it out. And while you're there, scroll through. There are so many amazing things there. But if you do end up bidding on ours and you end up winning, basically the money you bid will go to the Jack Vassal Fund and we will do matching funds to care.org to get even more help to the people of Ukraine. Okay, folks, I know that was all very heavy, but you know we are all humans. We are all in this together. I have so many fans of the show in the Ukraine who have reached out to me, and I just want to say we are all with you. I also have a lot of friends in Russia, or I, I, fans of the show. And um, you know, I know, I, I think it's so important that I am letting all of you know that you know, Ukraine is out there, and, and, and if you stand in opposition to your government, we are with you too. I, I've heard from so many folks as while well, I've been wearing the shirt, and while Jen has been fundraising, it's just been absolutely incredible. And um, I think that's it. So, without further ado, folks, you want to hear a countdown about games, don't you? That's what you showed up for? Well, you're in luck. Um, you're going to get it, and we're going to start out with Shay, my number one contributor to the channel. For now, watch out, Shay. Kim is coming up fast. And let's see what he had to play. Shay, take it away. Hey folks, so I actually played a ton of games this month because I went to Dice Tower West. Uh, I played a lot of great stuff, um, and I could talk for hours about all of them, but I don't want to take up too much of your time, so I'm going to pick a couple highlights from the con, and uh, I'm going to put those into my list. Um, but let's get started with uh, game number four, which is Darkest Dune. Now, this was a paid preview. This is a very dark uh, game about, I mean, obviously it's in the name, uh, but besides just the look of the game. The theme of the game is very, very heavy and very dark and, and gothic in a lot of ways. And it 
follows these anthropomorphic animal uh, people who are trying to save the land of Betel from this calamity that is coming. This actually already destroyed the world, but they've been given another chance. They've gone back in time to try and save, uh, save the world, essentially. And it was a really interesting game. There's a lot of different ways you can play it. There's like four different uh, possible victory conditions. It's competitive, though the theme makes it seem more cooperative than anything. It's sort of a semi-co-op, but there's only going to be one winner. Um, and it was really a really interesting, really a really cool game. Um, the only reason it's on the bottom of my list is that it was a little, uh, it was complicated. It's a very complex game. Luckily, Ryan did a great rules video for it, but it's there's a lot of finicky things to it. So that... Mm, tempered my excitement just a little bit, but the, the ideas and the scope of the game are really ambitious and they pull it off pretty well, so I do still recommend it. Uh, now my number three game is another paid preview. This was Stellar Expedition. Now not only did I cover that on Rado, I also made a rules video on my channel, uh, RTFM, um, and this game is something that I've been looking for for quite, <clears throat> for quite a while, which is a Star Trek game. Now I know that there are Star Trek there are games that are in the Star Trek universe, but this is a game that really feels like you're in the Star Trek world, like you are part of the Federation, because it is not about combat. This is a game about exploration, and mostly peaceful exploration at that. You just sort of go around the galaxy, you encounter new worlds, and you pop down embassies, and you invite new people into your crew, and you try to uh, complete missions and stuff. So it's a very easygoing game. It's very light conflict. Um, Two-player actually can get a little bit competitive, but uh, for the most part, it's pretty it's pretty low conflict and, and pretty, like I said, easygoing game, a nice sci-fi experience. So I really liked it for that. Uh, now, uh, going on to my number two game, this is one of the uh, Dice Tower West games. Uh, this is Decorum. Uh, it's one of the two that I really want to highlight because this game is wild. It, so. The premise is simple. It's a co-op game. You play as a group of housemates who are trying to decorate your shared living space in a way that satisfies everyone's tastes. And everyone's tastes are determined by a few cards that you get that determine like um, what you specifically want from uh, rooms in the house. And so there are things like you can change the paint color and you can put out uh, three different, you know, things that you, uh, curios or, or like lamps or just stuff that you'd have in your house. And there are different types and different like colors that these can be. And so you might think, you might have a, a, a rule that says, you know, if uh, the walls are painted red, I don't want any curios in the room or something like that. And everyone's got their own set and they're all kept secret. So on your turn, you'll just make a change or you'll, you'll take something out or you put something in or you'll swap something and and then everyone will sort of go around and passive aggressively tell you how they feel about it. It's like the, it's a very passive aggressive house meeting kind of thing for uh, for these roommates. And so it has this combination of hidden information uh, or, or like mostly hidden information and a little bit of role playing because you, if you really get into the spirit of it, which I did and the group that I was playing did, uh, you really have a lot of fun with it. I think it just came out recently. Uh, Definitely check out Decorum uh, if you like these quirky little uh, co-op games. Uh, but my number one uh, is one that I think a lot of people were talking about. I believe the hype folks, Ark Nova. It's fantastic. It's just such a great game. I mean, I love Terraforming Mars. Um, and I think this game might be better. I think it might. Gasp. It has a very similar feel <clears throat> to it. <clears throat> but it has a few things that are the key differences. One being uh, the player boards, you know, everyone's got their own personal player board as opposed to the shared, you know, Mars board. Um, but also the way that actions are done, I think is a big difference. I think it's much improved. It has a very, uh, very engaging way to play. And this is uh, taken directly from the Civilization uh, board game, which the second Civilization board game, uh, A New Dawn. Um, and <clears throat> I've played Civilization board game. I think it's decent. I think with the expansions a lot better. I think that the action system is the best thing about it. So if you're going to lift something from that game, absolutely lift that. It's one of those things where you've got five different actions you can do. They are on a row bl below you and you will pick one action. And the farther to the right that it is, the more powerful that action becomes. And so you want to, and but then as soon as you do it, it shunts back to the one position, slides everything over. So ideally you'd be doing all of the level five actions for their most powerful abilities, but that's not always what you want to do. So 
you have to make these complex choices. And then on top of that, there's the great engine building uh, mechanics that are very familiar if you've played Terraform Wars. Now, I don't know that Terraform Wars will ever leave my collection. I love the theme so much, the setting of it. I personally like the space exploration a little bit more than the building a zoo uh, ideas from Ark Nova, but oh boy, it is such a great game. So. Uh, those are the games that I played that I specifically wanted to highlight this month. Uh, and now a uh, quick personal note, I'm not gonna be in the roundup next month. Um, I do still have some videos that are gonna come out. I've been kind of spacing them out and you know pre-making them uh, to prep for this. But the reason for this is that I'm actually getting married at the end of April. And so I'm taking a little bit of time off uh, to you know focus on that. And then uh, I'll be going away uh, at the end or in May for, for our honeymoon. So. Um, you won't see me next week uh, or next month for the roundup, but I will still have videos coming out and then I'll be back uh, probably uh, for the roundup following that. But anyway, that's enough from me. I will hand it back to you, Rado. Bye, folks. Bye. Shay, congratulations so much. I am so happy for your coming nuptials. And while it does mean uh, we're not going to be seeing as much of you for a little while because you will be uh, having, I hope, a, a wonderful, wonderful holiday, I'm sure folks can't get enough of you and cannot wait for you to come back. And uh, yeah, that was a great list of games. Definitely, um, you don't have to limit yourself to just the games that you covered for the channel. What other hot games did you play? I'm sure that people want to know. And uh, believe me, folks, you have not heard the last of Ark Nova and um, Decorum, uh, your number one and two. I might have a few things to say about them coming up later. But before we get to that, uh, Shay is not the only member of the team that uh, was very busy this month. Uh, Ryan Crichton of Knights Around a Table did a couple of rules runs-throughs, starting with with Cellulose, which is a very, very cool new game from Genius Games. And Genius Games things is they make fun, uh, you know, kind of relatively lightweight, gateway-ish, family-level Euro economic simulations that teach real, interesting, and compelling hard science. And this game is all about digging deep into um, plant cells uh, and, uh, you know, basically educating everybody about the process of photosynthesis. And if you check out Ryan's Rules Run-Through, it's not an actual gameplay, but man, Ryan's Rules Run-Through do such a fantastic job of encapsulating the feel of the game, and I cannot wait to give this one uh, a try, uh, try myself. So, Ryan covered cellulose. He also covered, um, oh, what's it called? Uh, Darkest Doom, uh, which, you know, uh, uh, Shay did a run-through for it as well. So you had a nice one-two combo. You can watch Ryan uh, teaching you all the rules of the game, and then you can watch Shay and see, well, he actually does. And uh, yeah, I mean, Shay already kind of talked about this a little one about, I mean, this is a big monster hit on, um, is this on Kickstarter or GameFound? I don't remember for sure. But, you know, big miniatures, big ideas, big expansive game. And so far, it has really taken off. So Ryan will definitely get you set um, with his signature really highly polished uh, presentation that he does with his rules videos. So you don't want to miss that. And then finally, he still wasn't done. He also covered Ryozen, which is another uh, fundraising game that's uh, running right now, which has this really cool tower in the center of the board that rotates and is constantly changing the state of the game. And um, yeah, let's see. I want to show you, Ryan, show yeah, there, yeah, this is the tower. So the tower is on a central thing that rotates around and is constantly creating new opportunities for everybody as you do all kinds of good fantasy Euro-y stuff. And um, uh, yeah, it is definitely worth checking out also. So Ryan was very busy and I think he's going to be back with some more stuff in April so you can watch this space soon. But you know what? As much as I love um, you know all the videos that Ryan and Shay have been doing for the channel lately... What I'm really excited about these days is Kimberly Tolson of T uh, Tabletop Tolson. She covered, oh, what was it? Return to Dark Tower. This is the second video she has done on the channel. In February, she covered Seven Wonders Architects. And then as she hit um, Return to Dark Tower, which was a big jump up. A, a nice. She started with a nice little simple light family weight game. And then she got this big monster cooperative game that is I would have had a hard time um, doing 
doing a run through for this. And actually, I thought it was brilliant that to be able to show the game off, she busted out a lazy Susan so that she was able. And I, I thought that was so brilliant. Why haven't I been doing that forever on my videos when I have 3D objects that block the view? Uh, Kimberly is doing fantastic. If you haven't checked it out yet, I strongly recommend. I mean, she just brings such a sense of fun and enthusiasm. She might actually out enthusiasm me, which I didn't think was actually possible. So, um, you know, she is the latest. She's going to have several games. Uh, she'll be filling in for Shay in the month of April while he's off. Uh, like I said, Shay, Kim is coming for you. And uh, I mean, I, I, she's just getting better with every video she does. So I am super duper excited uh, to have Kim on the team. Okay, but uh, that's it, folks. Those are the contributors. Now, let's talk about the games Jen and I played. Uh, a bunch of them were ones that I played not with my wife, Jen, but instead with folks at the Dice Tower West convention at the beginning of the month. And so for those I don't have video, you're just going to see pictures of that I took while I was playing. And uh, you know what? The first one, number 18 on my list, is one of those games. It is Namiji which um, is basically a sequel to, uh, to Kaido from the uh, designer... Oh my gosh, so the designer of Seven Wonders... Antoine Bowser. And this is basically what would happen if Takedo was set at sea as you're riding a ship um, and you know, going on wonderful voyages, seeing wonderful sights and doing various and sundry set collection elements instead of Takedo where you were just doing going for a walk through the countryside. So it has a strong nautical flair to it. And the gameplay is still the same. The whole board is one long time track where the farther somebody moves forward, uh, the longer it'll take before they get to take another turn. But you sometimes want to make big jumps to grab all the most important things to you. I mean, actually, it, it's I would say this game is probably 80% to Kaido. But the 20% that is new and different, I've got to say, is a big improvement. To Kaido has always been a very, very, um, uh, you know, on the lighter end, gateway style game, and it does that great. This one, Namiji, definitely adds new, heavier gameplay elements to it that I very much appreciate it. Now, at the end of the day, it comes in at the bottom of my list, not because of the gameplay, but because of the two-player scaling. Uh, like Takaido before, the way it works for two-player is there's a third player that players take control can, um, and just use that only to screw each other over. So what what in a higher player count is actually it's a, a, a tense but very peaceful and live-and-let-live style game becomes a very vicious um, knife fight as you're constantly trying to cut off your opponents from what they need most. And I wasn't a fan of it in Takaido. I'm not a fan of it in Namiji. But, you know, that's really... If you're looking for a cutthroat, light, gateway-style game for two that works wonderfully at higher player counts, too, and is just drop-dead gorgeous, you might want to check out number 18, Namiji. Then we go on to number 17, which is Libertalia Winds of Gale Crest. And actually, I gotta come clean. I played this and filmed this back in February, and I completely forgot to include it in the February roundup. So I am playing catch up now. Um, ultimately, uh, if you went to the Dice Tower West library and you went to the hot games area where they had all the hottest stuff, there was a table devoted to this. That was my copy of the game. Because, as you might guess, coming in at number 17, it's not really a game for me and Jen, but it's so good. Uh, this is a remake of a uh, kind of a modern classic pirate Euro game where everybody has access to the same crew of, uh, of ne'er-do-wells who all have just such an incredible wide variety of special effects. And everybody is picking at the same time cards to play and reveal, trying to figure out what their opponent's going to do and outmaneuver them. So, um, you know, Libertalia has always been a well-loved game, but it's been out of print forever. And this new version, I think, is superior in every way. The two-player scaling is better. Uh, it's deeper and richer. There are more cards. There's more variety to the crew. Um, it's it's kind of a, you know, a, a Marmite thing. Some people don't like the new look and would rather have classic pirates. I think the new anthropomorphized animal pirates are neat as all get out. Both my wife and I really enjoyed the, the new cleaner aesthetic of it. But there's no denying um, there is a reason this is a modern classic. There is a reason this game was going for hundreds of dollars on the used market because people were so desperate to get it. And I'm so happy it's available now in a better package than ever before. Uh, I was very impressed. But the reason it comes in low is because my wife and I are Care Bears. And even though it works great 
great now, better than it ever has as a two-player game, uh, it's still a little bit too cutthroat for me and Jen. There's still way too many opportunities to say, oh, it'd be a real shame if all that uh, treasure you got over there might get stolen by me. Bye bye Boink! And it's just, it, it's great if you like that, but just not our thing. But I, I was so keen to try it, especially because it introduced new solo rules. And I love this game as a solo game. I almost kept it. I thought it was so much fun. I would almost say it's a better solo game than a two-player game, and it's already a very two good two-player game. Now, this game is always best when you're playing with big groups of players, but um, solo players, definitely check out my run-through where I demonstrated how it worked as a solo game. Very, very impressive. Um, number 17 of the month, last month, really, uh, Libertalia wins of Galecrest. Then we move on to number 16, Neko Harbor, the card game. Oh my goodness. This is a wonderful, lovely, charming little engine building game where each player controls their own, um, what would you call it? I guess sightseeing operation. We are trying to build up a fleet of ships that can travel around to locations in the Antarctic so that people can study and watch uh, the uh, penguins in their natural habitat. Um, and yeah, I mean, actually, the, now that I think about it, the rules never say, are we actually scientists or are we tour guides? It could go either way. I like to think we're scientists studying. But the important thing is not that. The important thing is this is an engine building game where every turn you are going to play a new card to the right of this line of cards you're building. And this represents kind of like a shipping line that your ships can actually move along. And as they move along, they will activate all the different spokes of your engine. And so you're trying to play cards in the correct order so that they will um, most um, efficiently pay out for you both when the ships, when your ships that you build and invest in come into port, but also your engine runs automatically every round. So this is an engine building game where you get double use out of your engine. The whole thing runs every round, and then parts of it can run again if you can get enough fuel to have your ships visit certain parts of the engine. And, um, and then the engine does different things. And now all of this is ultimately to build up enough resources to get enough fleets of ships so you can send your ships to the islands, and then there's kind of an area control going on for dominance to see who um, you know got the most of their fleet to the various spots. And so there's brinksmanship for that. It's very well done. Everything about this game is absolutely fantastic. If you if you're ever the type of person who says, "Hey, what are unsung gems that are you know flying under the radar that people should really know about?" Neko Harbor is it. Neko Harbor, the card game, is a brilliant, brilliant game. Both Jen and I liked it quite a bit. Um, if you watch my final thoughts, you'll hear my only complaints are with a, a handful of very simple to implement um, you know, house rules, uh, homebrew variants, you could make this game fantastic as a two-player experience. But with the rules as written, the two-player game suffers a little bit. Uh, you know, there's not as much tension as there should be. Um, you know, th things are a little bit easier to do. And, um, you know, I have actually gotten to play this at, a, at the full four-player count, and I liked it so much more. And honestly, I believe... I, 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 if you actually go to the comments of my Final Thoughts video, well, the uh, designer of the game said, you know what, you have some really interesting ideas, because he enjoyed seeing my Final Thoughts about how to two-player... And so I, you know, and I don't know, maybe those things will change and maybe Neko Harbor will raise. I mean, because if I were ranking this as a four player game, this would have been in my top five of the month. It's that good. This is one of the coolest engine building games I've played in quite a while because of the whole double engine um, use thing. But as a two-player game, it just needed a few very simple tweaks to really reach its full potential. So that's why I'm rating it on the rules as written. So it comes in at number 16, Neko Harbor. Then we move on to number 15, Monasterium, which is a game that I have wanted to play for several years now. Uh, came out, I think... In 2020, maybe 2019, from publisher DLP Games, you know the uh, the publisher of uh, Orléans and, and quite a few other really big hit games. And I've always thought the idea of this game sounded so very very cool. It is a dice drafting game, but and there's a lot of dice drafting games out there. And dice drafting is maybe my favorite mechanism of all time. So of course I really wanted to try it. What makes this different from all the other dice drafting games out on the market is the fact that in most dice drafting games you get a big old pool of dice, you roll them, and then players take turns grabbing whatever dice works best for them to achieve whatever their goal are. Whether you're talking, you know, Pulsar, um, you know, 2849 or Twa or whatever it is. The twist with Monasterium is 
you get this big pool of dice, um, but you get you divide it amongst all the players. Everybody rolls their own little pool, and um, then starts adding dice to the central pool. And everybody's kind of almost going through sort of a Yahtzee-ish style gameplay mechanism because you know I roll all my dice. I've got to add some dice to the pool that we will all then have access to. And I look over at your board, and I can see that you have upgraded to your board so that every three that you can draft is super powerful. And I just rolled a bunch of threes. I don't want to give you all those threes, so am I going to put this six over here instead? And so, players are communally creating a drafting pool that then we will all have access to. And this adds such an interesting layer on top of traditional dice drafting that I absolutely loved it. Really, really cool. Now, it comes in at the lower end for pretty much the same reason as the other games I was talking about. There's a handful of things that could have been done to tighten up the two-player game. And um, if that had been done, I think it would have rated quite a bit higher. This is definitely a game that I would love to play at higher player counts. And the thing is, even though it's on the lower end of my um, list, I think we're going to keep this one. I think this is going to stay on the shelf for a while anyway, because I definitely, definitely, definitely want to spend more time with the absolutely lovely number 15, Monasterium. Okay, then we move on to number 14, another game I played at Dice Tower West, Chai T for Two. And now I was playing a prototype. Uh, as I understand it, this was a Kickstarter, pretty successful on Kickstarter. It's taken a while, but they are finally this year, um, you know, starting to get it or get close to getting it shipped out to backers on the Kickstarter. So I played a prototype, and all I can say is, folks, believe me, it will be worth the wait. This is a two-player only game, all about um, harvesting and then processing tea leaves to fulfill contracts chai tea leaves, I suppose, to fulfill contracts and um, score lots of points. Kind of typical Euro fair. So what makes this game different is um, it's a card game at heart. And as you're playing, you are drafting cards from the center of the table. And depending on what type of card it is, you are um, a surrounding your board with them, putting some on the left side of your board, some on the right side of the board, some on the top, some on the bottom. And those are upgrading your production chain. Um, because when you get new tea, which is another thing you can draft, I should say, oh, by the way, a dice a, a cards are just one of the things you can draft. You can, you're spending dice as worker placement to draft all kinds of things. One of the things you're drafting is tea that um, you know comes in at the bottom of your board, and then it will slowly work its way up your board, going through oxidation process, processes and switching from one type of tea to another, all kinds of stuff, to where it will ultimately get to your waiting contract cards that you've installed at the top of the board. The tricky thing is, the cards you put on the side of your board, these upgrade the stages of development. So this is kind of a goods, um, a harvesting goods production engine building game where uh, there's this kind of uh, you know board component where the places you put your engine pieces directly affect how effective they're going to be, because you're trying to create combo chains on the left side so that Hey, when I put, uh, you know, uh, 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 oh, I can't think of the names of the tea. A black tea down in the bottom right corner, and it starts working its way up. I want it to hit this module and this module, and then I want it to switch over to the other side and hit the other module. So you can have like this really cool one, two, three thing that can um, you know, multiply the output, all kinds of fun stuff. It was a very cool, puzzly uh, little engine builder, and um, I, I played the advanced version. The, the base version comes with simpler rules where the production is a little bit simpler, a bit more straightforward, but um, I played the advanced a few times times during the convention, and I kind of fell in love with it. And I really want to get a copy of this now and play it with Jen, because she is an avid tea drinker. She is an avid Euro um, goods conversion engine builder, and this game just ticks all our boxes. Number 14, um, Chai. T for two. Okay, but we're not done yet. Let's move on to number 13, Jack. Now, this was a paid Kickstarter preview, I should say. And um, JAK is a uh, is actually an acronym. J-A-Q stands for Journey, Adventure, Quest. Those are the three types of cards that are available to you in this competitive um, fantasy action adventure card game. And what's interesting about the game is uh, it's, it's, it's kind of got a, you know, a fairly straightforward card draft. But the interesting thing is as you collect more and more cards, these cards become upgrades for your existing weapons and armor and spells you can do. And I mean, you can see in the picture, if, if you're looking at the screen, how the cards just stack. And um, the more cards you put on a given weapon or your helmet or whatever, the more interesting additional attributes that item gets 
gets. Um, you know, some of them good, some of them bad. I mean, there you can actually get cursed items that will make your your sword weaker or something like that. But that's okay because you want it because it'll also give you a lot of money, and you need that money to pay for the other stuff you need. So throughout the game, it is a very satisfying um, set collection game at its heart because you're trying to get all these different types of cards to mix and match together. And while you're doing it, you are leveling up all of your different elements of yourself. And at the center of the board, while all this is going on, there is a big boss monster. And everything we're doing is getting ready to fight the boss monster. And the boss monster levels up the same way. As you go through three days, the first, second, and third day, the first boss monster you fight, um, it's... Uh, attributes stick around when you fight the second boss monster. So while you're getting progressively stronger, the bad guys are getting stronger too. And it has a really good flow, a nice, simple, clean, elegant um, card drafting game um, with very, very satisfying set collection. Uh, just a really great presentation. Now, I'm actually going to be doing a run-through for this, but it's not going to be for several months. I played this really, really early. And uh, I'm glad I did because Jen and I very much enjoyed it. Number 13 of the month, Jack or Journey Adventure quest. Okay, then we move on to number 12. Oh my goods, Escape to Canyon Brook. And um, I've taught, I've done a few videos about Oh My Goods, or Royal Goods, as it's officially called. Um, or it's, it was originally published in German, and it was called Royal Goods. It was picked up for wider distribution, and then it was changed to Oh My Goods. I prefer Royal Goods, but Oh My Goods is fine. Um, but it's a fun little engine building game. Um, that uh, mixes the engine building part. Oh, I'm trying to invest in all these different uh, elements that allow me to, um, um, uh, you know, uh, produce coal, produce uh, linen, produce. A uh, dairy, and um, the game is all about trying to get multiple uh, cards in play that will create production chains, so that when I run the colliery and it generates coal, I'll be able to immediately pump that coal into a different production building that consumes it. And so it's all about creating. It's and and uh, uh, but the trick is, every round you don't know if you're going to get all the fuel that you need to run all the different elements of your production chains. And so there's a push your luck element where you can kind of take... You, you, I don't want to take chances. I, I think I'm going to try to produce less this turn because I don't think the market is going to give me everything I need, or I can risk everything and maybe it blows up in my face and I get nothing. So the core game has always been great. But what I've really loved about Oh My Goods is it's... Uh, um, Escape to Canyon Brook is the second expansion. The first one was Revolt in Longsdale, and Escape to Canyon Brook is the second in a series that tells a narrative story. Uh, oh My Goods is from designer Alexander Fister, one of my favorite uh, designers of all time, and one of the things I love most that he does is, uh, in a lot of his games, he comes up with narrative little miniature campaigns you can play through. Rather than having an expansion that says, look, here's all the new stuff, just throw it in. He, uh, you can do that if you want, that's an option. Or instead, you can play through a multi-chapter story that slowly introduces all the new things to the game you already love. And introduces new characters that then become playable cards and all kinds of stuff. And Escape to Canyon Brook is the second in a series of storytelling. And I still absolutely adore it. I've been wanting to play it forever. I finally um, took the chance to do it because there's another thing both of the expansions do. For Oh My Goods, they added solo mode. And I had never tried it. I finally sat down to do it, and it's great. I played through the first chapter and got my butt kicked. And then I played through it a second time, and I got my butt kicked. Um, but I feel like... Uh, I, can, I think I've got it now, and I can probably move on. There's one thing you have to know. If you're interested in Oh My Goods as a solo game, these expansions, uh, Revolt of Longsdale and Escape to Canyonbrook, really bring the goods. It's fantastic. The only problem is, oh my god, they're hard. Jeez Louise, they're super monstrously hard, and there's nothing in the rules to be able to adjust the difficulty level. And that's kind of a cardinal sin for a co-op game, not to let players adjust the difficulty to ensure they're having fun. And so if I were rating this only as a solo experience, as good as it was, it was kind of frustrating as well. I probably wouldn't have come in as high at number 12, um, but... It's a great... It's just great to see the story continue. Uh, Revolt at Longsdale literally ended with a cliffhanger. And so the story continues um, with Escape to Canyon Brook, and I was happy to get to spend some time with it. Number 12. Oh my goods. Escape to Canyon Brook. Okay, then let's move on to number 11, a very, very mega popular game, Fantasy Realms. Oh my gosh. This is um, such a well-loved... Uh, competitive card game uh, all about set collection and um, I 
totally understand having played. I played this a bunch of times. I actually got to play it with Shay. Uh, and uh, well, well, did I play with him as well? No, I, I played Oak with him, I think. Or maybe I played. Anyway, I, I played it um, with um, Amy of Thinker Themer. I, I got to play this with a bunch of people. Jeff from Dice Star West. I. I didn't want to return it to the uh, Dice Tower West library. I was having so much fun with it. And I can totally see why. Um, there is a, a game I did a run-through for a few months ago, Red Rising from Stonemeyer Games. And, and, it, and they say right in the rulebook that I love Fantasy Realms so much, I wanted to make a heavier, richer, more complex version of Fantasy Realms. Because Fantasy Realms is a very lightweight kind of gateway-style game. And when I covered... Red Rising. And I thought, oh my god, this is amazing. I love it to pieces. A lot of people said, yeah, but you should really play Fantasy Realms more because it's cleaner, it's simpler, it's more elegant. All that is true. Is I mean, this is an addictive game. You play it, you're done in 10-15 minutes, you want to play it again immediately, and all it takes is shuffling up the deck and dealing out cards. It's just fast, and everybody's engaged right to the end. The reason is because it's the rules are simple. On your turn, draw a card and then discard a card. You keep doing that until the game is over, and then the car... The hand of cards you have at the end is how you score your points. And the trick is, every time you have to discard a card, you're potentially putting something on the table that other players could take that will be the game winner for them. And so you have a lot of attention. Almost kind of Lost Cities, Reiner Kenichi attention. And it just works beautifully, brilliantly. Personally, I still prefer Red Rising, even though I've now spent a lot of time... And by the way, don't be fooled. The, the box for Fantasy Realms lies. It says it's a three to seven player game, if I recall. Anyway, but the important thing is, this game has awesome two-player rules in the rulebook. I played this as a two-player game, and it's fantastic! This is a great two-player game. I highly recommend it. Like I said, I still prefer Red Rising, but I really like this one a lot, too. Number 11 at the show, Fantasy Realms. And folks, let's move on to number 10 on the list, through Ice and Snow. Now, this is a another uh, Kickstarter preview for a game that's going to be going live very, very soon in April. And Jen and I both had a blast. This is a very compelling and maybe one of the most thematically grounded Euros I have played in quite a while. This really brings its subject matter to life um, in a way that few games can match. It is about charting the Northwest Passage. And the interesting thing of this game, it's competitive from a gameplay point of view, is even though we're all trying to get the most glory uh, by you know making the most discoveries, um, you know setting up infrastructure for future expeditions, there's all kinds of things we can do. We are all part of the same expedition. So every choice I make, affects everybody else around the table. Um, you know, we take turns deciding which path is the expedition going to follow. Um, we uh, do a lot of worker placement. And the worker placement in the game is very, very interesting because you have three workers that you always have. Um, you know, your captain, your craftsperson, your, or your, your carpenter, and your scientist. Those are your officers. And then you have enlisted crew. And if you don't take care of those enlisted crew, they will starve and die. Or they will mutiny. Or they will get scurvy. All kinds of things can happen. But the important thing is you can supplement your crew based on what you do over the course of the game by um, befriending and working with the native peoples of the land, the Inuit tribes that are available. And um, let me just say, folks, I have never seen a publisher do a better job at um, involving the people who they are making a game about. The uh, I was talking to the developers of Red Tomatoes. They have worked. They're working with Canadian National Museum. They are working with tribal elders of the Inuit tribes that still live in these areas. Uh, they are paying for the consultation from the folks. And this is, I think, by far the biggest shining star for how board games can be at once more. In inclusive and more rich and deep when you spend the time to actually do a little bit more research than just checking out a Wikipedia article about your subject matter. And I'm absolutely blown away by it. Now, all that aside, it's a very, very compelling um, game, too. Uh, and it's very tense, because not everybody will make it to the end. You will have mutinies. You will have starvation. You will be constantly um, facing the threat of running out of resources and um, having to deal with decisions your fellow expedition members make that can make things even harder for you to try to get out of the hole you find yourself in. And it's a beautiful game, and it is a tension-filled game, and it's an incredibly thematic game. And I'm really impressed by number 10, uh, Through Ice and Snow. 
But then we move on to a number nine, another game from the convention, Dice Miners. And now this one, I have to say a big thank you to uh, my you know co-host on the R and R show, Royal Gaviola. He brought his own personal copy to the convention, and he carried it with him everywhere. And if you um, ever ran into him and said, "Oh, I really, why well, someday I'd like to play a game with you," he'll say, "Okay, let's just grab a table right now and play Dice Miners." He must have played I don't know how many times. I played it with him two or three times back to back. And I fell in love with it. I really, really dig this dice drafting game um, where we are all dwarves trying to, um, you know, be very successful. Um, you know, dig deeper pr- to protect our minds from dragons and uh, do all kinds of typical dwarvy stuff. Find treasure, and it all works off of a very, very cool draft mountain where you have a stack of dice, and you can only take dice from the top. And as you do that, you reveal dice below that your opponents will be able to grab. Think of the um, card drafting in you know, Seven Wonders Duel, right? Where you've got that pyramid, and the more things you take, the more you reveal for your opponents. You're like, I don't want to reveal that for you. But the beautiful thing about this game is dwarves love beer. And the use of beer, um, if you get beer dice, well, not only do you share it with your opponents, which is a cool idea in itself, but it lets you dig deeper into the mountain so you don't have to be stuck with what's on the top. And you can pull off some very, very cool um, and surprising combo moves as well. Plus, everybody has you know their own unique special power depending on which dwarf they are. Yeah, I mean, this game is... I can totally see why it has been such a phenomenon and so many people are talking about it. Man, I really want to get a copy of myself and do a full run-through. But, I mean, I'd love to play it with Jen too because I think she'd love it also. And, um, yeah, I, I pretty much played it at a higher player count. I would definitely like to play it as a two-player game too to see how well it holds up. But, um, you know, viewed as a uh, fast, super-duper filler, fun, fun, fun game. I mean, the fun is just off the charts with this one. It comes in at number nine, Dice Miners. But we are not done yet, folks. Let's move on to number eight, the Paradox Initiative, which is another uh, Kickstarter preview, the paid Kickstarter preview that will be coming in April. Uh, Jen and I played this month. And actually, I should say, Jen and I played this years ago, over half a decade ago. Paradox came out, and I, at the time, thought it was an absolutely brilliant, um, what would you call it, Uh, uh, bejeweled. Uh, style game. Because the main portion of the game is you've got what's called the paradox matrix, full of paradox particles. And every turn, you are going to be able to flip um, one or, or two or three, depending on the situation you're in, of these little particles and try to create complete rows and columns of matching colors. And if you can do that, you can collect those particles and use them um, to act as resources to be able to score cards. And um, the other half of the game is this uh, card draft, where cards come and go fast. This is not one of those drafting games where, you know how sometimes the drafting games, man, will this market ever clear out? I'm so sick of looking at this card, nobody wants it. In this game, there are six, seven, eight, or nine cards every round that just disappear. You are burning through these cards super fast because they're only available through an unstable wormhole in space. So if you see a card you want to grab because it's part of a really strong set collection you're going for, you better grab it quick. So the tension for drafting is high, high, high. But then once you've got the card, you, depending on whether it is a card where you are studying the past, the present, or the future, because this is a game all about using paradox particles to manipulate the time stream, um, you have more or less time to gather the resources out of your matrix to be able to score the cards. And if you don't score them in time, you end up losing those cards anyway. So you are under an incredible amount of tension, both in the draft and in the fulfillment. And all of it is driven by a very fun, satisfying little bejeweled like um, puzzle that exists in parallel to the game. And so, really liked it a lot. Liked it a lot half a decade ago. Like it even better now. There's additional things like switches that have been introduced, special powers that weren't in the original game. Really impressive. Um, But what's maybe even more impressive is the lineup of artists they've got working on this game. Um, I would imagine anybody who loves board games and has a list of their five favorite artists, chances are at least one of your five favorite artists worked on this game. There has never been an accumulation of top-tier, cream-of-the-crop artists working all on one game that I've ever seen. And this game was a joy to play, but it's also a joy to look at. And that's what brings it in at number eight, uh, the Paradox Initiative. 
But we are not done yet, folks. Let's move on to number seven, Decorum. I said it would be back, and it is back. Uh, I agree with everything Shay said. This game is a delight. I'm planning on trying to do a run-through on it in April, so you can see firsthand. Um, but this, it, why I love it is because it is a cooperative game of imperfect communication. That's one of my favorite things, where we're all working towards a common goal, but we can't just say, oh, this is what I need. If you could all, and So we have to try to in, in, um, intuit from what we see our teammates do. Oh, I see. Maybe you need this. And then I do an experiment. Oh, no, you hated that too? All right, well, man, I don't know what to do. But meanwhile, I'm trying to figure out what you've got going on. I'm trying to figure out what I need as well. And um, it's very thematic because it's all about housemates um, you know, trying to decorate a house, fulfilling everybody's needs, and it's very satisfying when you pull off the win. And um, But the rules are so clean and simple. It's so fast playing. And uh, yeah, the first time Jen and I played this, I was it was literally just a few days ago. Because I was getting ready for the uh, R&R show, and, and this was going to be on the table. I had already played it at Dice Tower West with some strangers, and it was amazing. What Shay said about the role-playing, even though I didn't know these people, we just instantly fell into, like, we'd been roommates forever. Uh, this game just kind of brought us together in this uh, communal story that was being told. We absolutely loved it. And so I wanted to play it with Jen. Finally played it. I only had a few hours before the R&R show went live, and I said, Honey, can we play this a little? Just play one quick game. It's like a 15-20 minute game. And uh, we sat and played back-to-back -back three games of it. Boom! boom, boom. And Jim would have kept going. He's like, I have to stop playing this now. I have to go live in an hour. Well, I don't have time for this anymore. So we both think it's really, really clever. And the longer you play, the more cool stuff you unlock as well. Um, because it's it's not a... Um, oh, what would you call it? It's a, not a competitive game or, or, a, or a, a, a legacy game, but it is a game that does have a storyline that will work its way through a lot of stuff. And um, you'll unlock more and more as you go. And I absolutely adore it. I like the presentation. I like the story that is told. I like the unlocks. And if you're worried that, hey, but are there only a finite number of things you get to do before you've used up all the stuff? The developers are working on digital apps that will make randomly generated missions so you will have infinite replayability with the game, which is also very, very nice. And uh, I have... Uh, nothing but the highest praise for this game, number eight, or seven, number seven, Decorum. Okay, then let's move on to number six, another paid Kickstarter preview. It is Oak. And this is such a pretty game. This one I got to play with Ruel at Dice Tower West. And then um, when I got back home, I played it with Jen. So I played at a high player count. I played at a low player count. It just works great. And um, the coolest thing about this worker placement game has to be the workers themselves. Because you get to customize them. As they level up, you can you know put clothes on them. Um, and uh, that changes what their powers are. When you send them out into the world, all these druids that are going into the area around the mystic tree so that you can gather the resources you need to be at one with nature and um, you'll build sacred sites and all kinds of fun stuff like that. So I will not deny that the toy factor of this game is wonderful. It's just It just feels good taking these regular, already neat-looking druid meeples you've got, but then adorning them with satchels and stuff is a lot of fun. But that's beside the point. The game is also a very fun worker placement game as well with a lot of really cool ideas as um, because every worker um, either uh, is available to us so that we can, you know, on our main board, so we can send them out. That means they're active or they're passive. They're hanging out under the tree. And a lot of times, to be able to do an action, you know, like harvest some resource or, you know, make some kind of artifact or whatever, if, if that space is blocked, I can still go there, even if your worker blocks, but I have to take some of my other workers and basically retire them to be under the tree. So things get very expensive very, very quickly. But there are actions I can take to take all these retired druids under the tree and bring them back into my fold so I can actually use them as workers. But I need them under the tree because those ones who are semi-retired or you know, at least not active, they're passive, they have functions too because I can have them go climb the tree which triggers um, in-game progression and gives all kinds of passive income benefits. I can have them go um, pick um, resources from the forest and that's the main way to get them is to have these workers not available to you so that when you pass at the end of the round while everybody else is still working with their active workers, my passive workers start going out and automatically generating resources, harvesting resources, finding them in the forest so that I'll be set up for the next round. I mean, that's a great idea that you very rarely see in games. The idea of, hey, the sooner I pass, the more passive automatic income I get, and it makes everybody else terrified. I've got to pass because you're getting all the good stuff and you're not leaving anything for me. And then 
Everything, all everything I just described is driven by a very cool hand management card game. Because you can't just send the workers where you want. You've got a hand of cards that says where you can send them. And when you send them to different places, the card also says, well, these are the actions they could do in this space. And you will get access to better cards over the course of the game. Um, and depending on how you build up your hand, uh, you can get stronger and stronger. And then there's, there's so many cool ideas. I love the way artifacts work. I love the way potions work. And I love the way housing works. If you want more workers, you have to build housing for them. There's a lot of really cool, very wonderfully implemented ideas. This is definitely a worker placement game that has a lot of additional layers. It goes far above and beyond what you normally see. And Jen and I really dug it. It's uh, number six on the list. Oak. Then we've got number five, Welcome to the Moon. And um, this is another one that I got to play at Dice Tower West, so I was just showing a picture. And uh, you know, if, you, if you're all familiar with Welcome Tool, Welcome to, which is a flip and write style game where every round there's a set of cards that um, are basically lead you to entwined drafting. I can take a card with a number and an icon or a different pair of number icon or a different number pair icon. The original Welcome to was basically set in French suburbia as we're trying to build out a model suburb home. The core gameplay is still available in Welcome to, but now we are traveling to the stars to save humanity. And the game comes with I don't know how many different missions, but each mission has its own completely unique roll and write or flip and write style board that everyone's playing on. The first one we played, because I played with a group of people, and we all thought, yeah, this is nice. If you like Welcome To, this is kind of a nice variation. But when we played the second one, which completely obliterated how we understood the Welcome To system and made us think about it in a completely new and different way, we were all flabbergasted and could not wait to keep playing this to see how else are they going to completely reinvent the wheel. Welcome to is already brilliant. I have Welcome to, but I now have Welcome to the Moon, and I don't think I'm going to keep holding on to Welcome to, because Welcome to the Moon offers so much more. Plus, I'll be honest, I really love the, uh, you know, the spacefaring theme and all that. It's absolutely phenomenal, and I must try all the other missions, and I cannot wait to play it with Jen, uh, because I know she already loves Welcome to, and oh man, her mind is going to be... I, I just can't wait to watch her mind be blown the way mine was when we get to that second mission. If you do, folks, I do have to warn you, though, if you do pick up Welcome to the Moon, the first mission has some really horrifically, some of the most poorly written rules... I've ever seen, specifically related to the first mission. They make it almost impossible to understand how to correctly play the first mission. So if you get this game, either skip the first mission or go download the FAQ from the publisher. Uh, because then, then you'll know how to actually play the first mission. But oh my god, once you get to that second mission, it's gloves off. I I've never seen anything quite like it. It's absolutely amazing. Welcome to the moon. Okay. Whoa, we're, we're in the final stretch now, folks. Let's move on to uh, number four. Wind the Film, another game from Dice Tower West. And I have to give a huge shout out to Jin, a fan of the show and a friend of Ruel Gaviola, and I assume a fan of Ruel's also, who brought two copies of the game. And he wanted to play this with me because I, I totally missed this game. It was, uh, uh, it's an older card game um, from Sashi and Sashi. And I really like their quirky offbeat uh, designs, but somehow I just missed this one at the time. And um, he brought it because he thought I'd like it. And he was right. I mean, you know, we were halfway through our first game. We actually, I played two games with him and his girlfriend. Uh, and at the halfway through the game, I was like, oh my God, I must get this game. This is absolutely incredible. And he said, I got you covered. Like I said, he brought two copies. He brought one to play with me, and then he brought one to give as a gift. So I brought it home, and thank you so much, Jen. Um, Jen and I, we actually, this is a picture of, of us playing it in our hotel room, um, you know, the next morning, when normally Jen has no time to play games. So I said, honey, you're going to love this, and she did love it. I guess I should say, why do we love it so much? This game is a uh, a uh, straight building card game, where you have to like build straights of you know, like four, five, six, seven, one, two, three, four, that kind of thing, and you're trying to grab cards in a very cool and very original draft where you um, don't always know what cards you're going to get because some of them are face down. You just know what range of number they have. So the draft is already really cool. But the most important thing about this game is your hand. This has the bonanza effect of not being able to rearrange the cards in your hand. So the cards go in on one side, they come out on the other, and everything is about trying to manipulate that so you can play the correct cards in the correct order so you can get those high-scoring straights. It's an incredibly clever game, incredibly tension-filled. I absolutely adore it. I will never get rid of it. Again, I just cannot say thank you to Jen enough. He was so right. It's my number four of the month. Wind the film! 
Whoa, and actually, before I go on uh, with the countdown, I should point out, if you're interested in the game, but you're having a hard time finding it under the name Why in the Film, it did get a reprint last year from some other publishers, and that might be easier to find, in which case you want to look for the game called Photograph. Uh, either way, it's fantastic. Okay. And now, if we move on to number three, Founders of Teotihuacan, which, folks, I do not know what's going on here. First, um, oh wait, no, I was about to give a spoiler for something that's coming. Okay, uh, let me rewind that a little bit. Um, folks, there's a trend that's happening. We've got Founders of Teotihuacan, uh, which is a sequel of sorts to Teotihuacan, which is certainly one of the cooler, um, you know, big, huge, epic Euro-style board games that have come out over the last five years. Uh, it's set in the Mayan culture as you're doing this kind of dice rondelle thing, uh, and it's a big, heavy game with a lot of moving parts. Here comes the sequel, Founders of Teotihuacan, which takes the same setting and some of the same ideas, most notably building a pyramid at the center. But now, everybody's got their own pyramid they're building, instead of building um, a kind of a communal one on the main board. And the dice rondelle, worker placement thing, has been replaced with um, worker placement tile drafting for polyomino Tetris pieces. So it's a very different game. Same setting, same kind of feel of the world, but such a hugely different game. And I love it! And here's the deal, folks. So the trend I just said is maybe starting. I love it better than the original. Teotihuacan is a brilliant game, made even better with some of its expansions. But if you put both of them down in front of me, I'd want to play Founders of Teotihuacan Six Ways to Sunday. It is a wonderful tile laying game, very fast, very deep. And what really makes it stand out from the huge assortment, over the last few years, we've gotten such a big um, cavalcade of polyomino tile laying style games. And polyomino, folks, when I say that, I really mean like Tetris pieces, right? You know, those are polyominoes. What makes this different is the world, the, the board I can place these on serves two functions. There's really three. There's where I place the tiles and I'm trying to, you know, jigsaw puzzle them together to make most use of space. But when I put down good producing tiles, I surround them with all the goods they produce in the form of, of uh, cubes for gold and lumber and stone. And so I have this tough thing. I want to get everything squeezed in really tight to get maximum use of space. But I need to keep everything really far away from each other so I've got enough room for all the goods I need, which are what I spend to be able to build more stuff. And this is absolutely brilliant. I absolutely love it. It's this extra twist that takes this so far above and beyond. And it's, well, it's obviously it's my number three game of the month. And there have been an amazing cavalcade of games that I've played. But Founders of Teotihuacan, oh... I, like I said, I've already predisposed to... I mean, I, I loved its predecessor, so I had a warmth for the game when he sat down. But then, when I saw how it actually worked, and also not for nothing, when I saw how the worker placement worked too, because this game isn't content just to reinvent tile-laying uh, Tetris pieces, it also reinvents worker placement. Because the worker placement spots, if I go to a spot, it's not blocked. Other players can go there. And what happens is, if I go there, if I'm the first to go there, I get to do a level 2 action. Because there's already a bonus tile. I do a really weak action, but I get the, the benefit of the bonus tile that I place my worker on. And then I do the main action. And now I've taken that bonus away. So, other players can go there, but why would they want to go there if I've already gotten the bonus? Because when somebody else goes there and places their worker discs on top of mine, they use both of our discs. And so suddenly they get to do a higher level action. But then I could come along later and say, you know what? I'm going to put another worker on that same space, and now I'm going to use three of those workers. So you get this compounding action thing that is really cool. But it's also an area control thing, because once three people have visited a space, it's locked out. Nobody else can go. So you want to wait for other people to take those early steps so that you can get in and do the super move at the end, uh, unless somebody else beats you to it. But you also want to be the first player to take the step so you can get those really cool bonuses. It's neat. Very, very good. Highly recommended. Again, no surprise. It's my number three of the month. Founders of Teotihuacan. Okay. But then, let's move on to an even better game. Number two, The Isle of Cats, Explore and Draw. And this is the other game that's in this new um, trend that I'm talking about, where the simpler, lighter, more streamlined sequel to a previously available big, ambitious game comes along and makes me fall in love with it so much that I'd rather play the sequel than the original. Isle of Cats is an incredible an absolutely awesome um, 
polyomino Tetris tile line game that's fused with card drafting, very, very reminiscent of uh, uh, Bunny Kingdom uh, or you know Seven Wonders or uh, Sushi Go, and it works great. Um, you know, it was probably my highest or second highest ranked. Uh, polyomino tile laying game of all time. It was so good. They were so deep and so rich, so much stuff going on. Although you could also turn a lot of those modules off and turn it into a very, very family-friendly introductory game too. Very impressive design. But then Frank West, the designer, goes and revisits it and turns it into a roll and write. Or, well, I guess a flip and write, because uh, there's a bunch of cards out. We're drafting the cards, doing entwined drafting, not dissimilar from Welcome To, and, uh, but still with the goal of filling up our ships full of cats. It used to be we actually had um, you know real cardboard tokens that represented the cats that we were trying to squeeze onto our ship. Now we actually write them with colored pens. And oh my gosh, Isle of Cats is amazing. Isle of Cats Explore and Draw is even better uh, for a bunch of reasons. And actually, if you want to know why, you don't have to take my word for it. Go check out my run-through that I filmed with Ruel Gaviola, my co-host from the r r show. We had a great time going up against each other, but also going up against you. Because this is a bingo-style game. Um, every round, everybody gets access to the same stuff. So if you go to my run-through for Isle of Cats Explore and Draw... Check out the show notes. There will be a link you can follow that will let you print out a black and white version of the board. And then you can play along with us and see if you can beat our scores. And you will see for yourself why this has got to be. This might be the best polyomino tile layer there is on the market. At least until Unknown Planet comes out. Because, oh my gosh, that's good too. But anyway, that's in the future. Um, <laughs> you know, A little bonus game to mention on the uh, monthly roundup. Isle of Cats Explore and Draw is just the best. Uh, everything I loved about the original one, and most notable the incredibly intricate polyomino pieces. These are not simple Tetris pieces. These are not L's and S's and O's and... Um, what's the other one? Uh, straight away. The line. Um, I's, I guess. These are incredibly complex things that are, you know, that, that are almost as tough to get to fit together as a real thousand-piece jigsaw puzzle. So it's so much more satisfying to make all these things work and plug the holes that you end up creating um, and try to fill your ship with as many cats as you can to save them from encroaching pirates. Love it to pieces. My number two game of the month, and that's saying something, folks. Isle of Cats, Explore and Draw. And the reason it's saying something is because I said right up front, uh, right after Shay's bit, that we were not done talking about some of the games he talked about. I uh, talked a bit about Decorum. It's time to talk about my number one game of the month, Ark Nova. Um, yeah. Any other year, this could be my game of the year, quite frankly. And um, I, I don't know if it's my number two or my number three of the year. I will be doing, in April or May, a revisit of my top ten of the year, 2021. Ark Nova's in the top three. And for all the reasons Shay talked about, you can just go back and watch what he said. I don't really want to repeat it. All I will say is, he says maybe it's better than Terraforming Mars. Uh-uh. No maybe about it. This thing, as far as I'm concerned, destroys Terraforming Mars because um, what he talked about, this brilliant system of action selection, which was borrowed from an older Civilization game. I think it was Civilization New Dawn, although it existed in a game even earlier than that. I have not played those, but it works so well here. And actually, it's interesting. When I, I played this with Shay at Dice Tower West, we sat down and played it, an epic two-player uh, between me and him. And, uh, and he was talking about New Dawn and how he thought this was better. This took the ideas from New Dawn and improved on them as well. And um, But anyway, it's so wonderful and satisfying. It's a big, epic beast of the game. And there's so many things I could talk about that I love about it. I think probably the most important thing for me, if I had to pick one thing, as much as it's about that action selection and how satisfying it is to build the habitats for the animals and the card combos and everything else, the thing I love more than anything else about the game is actually the story it tells. Because this is not just about building a zoo. There are two tracks that you are... Um, um, there's actually three tracks you're um, monitoring your progress on, but the two important ones for end of game and scoring are your income, uh, you know, the uh, the attraction of your zoo. Get more cool exotic animals that will just bring people through the front door so you can make money. But the reason you make money is not just to score points. Money's are not money is not points. You can. Sp- funnel that money into conservancy projects. And a big portion of the game, and that's the second meter you track yourself on, is how much have you given back to these animals? How many animals have you released to the wild? How many um, scientific studies have you sponsored to ensure that the uh, animals who are in the wild will actually have a brighter future? And at the same time that you are making habitats that are really 
comfortable so the animals can have um, fulfilling lives, um, you know, and, and, and you know, not, not be shortchanged. Not like the zoos that I went to when I was a kid in the 70s, and it was just all the animals just put into concrete pits with some old used tires for them to play with. We were making beautiful spaces for these animals to have rich lives, and the money we make on them means we can actually save animals in the wild. That's the crux of this story. This is a science led game. That it is all about the science of, of animal protection and animal rights that this game really puts first and foremost. That's where you get the majority of your points, not making money. And money is just a means to an end, and the end is saving animals and making their lives better. And um, yeah, I could talk forever about how great the gameplay is and how smart the, the action selection and the objective system is brilliant. Uh, when somebody uh, does an objective, you create objectives suddenly for everybody else. So many cool ideas. Now, the reason it isn't my number one game, and I already know it's not my number one game, is there are a couple of problems. Shea kind of brushed past them, but the game is long. There's no two ways about it. The developers say, oh, we can play a four-player game in, in an hour and 90 minutes. Yeah, sure, I suppose once I played this game 100 times, I might get that fast. But I, as we were playing it, I played this game several times at Dice Tower with a whole bunch of people. Mike Fitzgerald, one of the OG card game designers of the industry, uh, you know, baseball highlights, uh, Wyatt Earp, he walked by and said, oh, you enjoying it? Yeah, we played a game the other night. It was our fastest yet. Uh, four players. We got it done in four hours. And I think that was a pretty common thing. For people... I was playing with who were familiar with it, it's kind of assume an hour per player. And that is long. And that is hard. And the only thing keeping this game from the upper stratosphere for me is some kind of Terraforming Mars Prelude-esque expansion that lets you supercharge the game and get to um, the finish line faster. Um, when Jen and I got home and we played it, we were, I mean... Our, our first game took us over three hours. Now, that's because we were jet-lagged and we were super tired and we shouldn't have been playing it. But And we loved every second of it. Don't get me wrong. I would not begrudge them if they decided never to change it because every second of this game is brilliant. I just want to be able to play it more. And the shorter it is, the more I can play it. Who knows? Maybe like the previous two games in a couple of years, we'll be getting Ark Nova, the sequel, that is a brilliant game that um, you know I love even more than the previous. But for now, I it, it is pretty close to heavy, crunchy, thematic Euro perfection. My number one game of the month, and Shay's as well, Ark Nova. And that's it, folks. We are Dunsville. Hoorah! That was a whole bunch of games. And I am exhausted, but um, there's no rest for the weary because it's, uh, it's April. It's time for me to keep on making new games. And by the way, folks, I probably should have led with this, but I'll end with this instead. Uh, as of April of this year, 2022, it will be, I will have done 10 years of Rotto Run Through. It is my 10th anniversary. And if you're asking, well, what are you going to do? Nothing. I'm really not that big on anniversaries. Ask me, sometimes you ever meet me and Jen in real life. If you ever meet Jen in real life, ask her, what did we do for our 30th wedding anniversary? The answer will not impress you. Um, but I, I just wanted to mention that. I And I want to say thank you to everybody. I mean, as some of you watching this have probably been with me from day one, 10 years ago, when I picked up the camera and decided to shoot Helvetia, of all things, for some reason. There's been a lot of ups, a lot of downs, a lot of highs, a lot of lows. And, uh, and I'm more excited now about the channel than ever before as new voices are showing up. As, um, you know, Kim is... Shea is fantastic. Ryan does the best rules run-throughs ever. Uh, Ruel, uh, it's the high point of my week, every week, to sit down and talk to Ruel about games for two hours. It's a lot of stress in the lead-up because of all this live streaming, but I just love hanging out with Ruel, and he's just such a warm, wonderful person and brings such a great perspective to games. I love having him on the channel. Uh, Kim, Professor Kim, Kimberly Tolson is absolutely amazing. You just wait in April. This is going to be her month. She is going to explode, and you're all going to um, just wonder, why are we even watching Rado? Can Kim do more videos? And if all goes to plan, we're going to have some more new contributors appearing on the channel for the first time, and I may be the most excited about them yet. I have been a fan of this other channel. I will not say if it's a he or she. I don't want to spoil anything. I'll just say uh, this other channel, they, they are fantastic, and I am so excited, and uh, you'll be seeing them coming soon as well to celebrate the 10th anniversary, and uh, that's it. Folks, I guess in closing, one more thing, though, to make it a bit less about me and a bit more about the rest of the world and um, you know getting together as gamers and helping out uh, one more time 
Uh, if you go to, um, what is it? HTTP colon slash slash jv.rado.com, you can still bid on the last four of Jen's Ukrainian um, Witwat, and those will go to a very, very worthy goal. Oh, and while we're talking about another very worthy goal right now, if you don't watch it, um, the R&R show is a weekly show that Ruel and I do. Every Tuesday we stream it, and then it gets on YouTube every Wednesday, where we just do a top 10. The top 10 we did this week was upcoming Kickstarters, crowdfunding games, and if if you haven't yet, could you just go watch the first five minutes of that one? Because Ruel and I talked about a fundraising campaign that is very near and dear to our hearts. And if you're the type of gamer who has ever said to yourself, boy, how can I spread the gospel of board games? How can I you know, open up more eyes? This is your opportunity to do it. Um, there's a link for it down in the show notes. You can hit that eye on the top right corner of the screen. Just watch the first five minutes of episode 34 of the R&R show. And um, if you're going to back anything on uh, board game related in the month of April, please consider the uh, the one that Ruel and I talked about at the beginning of the show. And uh, that's it, folks. Oh my goodness. I gotta get to work. Uh, there is no rest, and there's plenty more games that are coming. If you wanna know what games I'm covering, and uh, me and others are covering, hit that eye in the top right corner screen. Go to comingsoon.rado.com, and you'll be able to uh, plan accordingly. But, folks, I am Dunsville. So, I wanna say thank you for watching this, and thank you for everybody who's been with me all the way through. Uh, ten, it's been 10 crazy years, um, and I've learned a lot. And also, of course, in closing, thanks to the sponsor of the show. Fun Again Games. Have a very, very nice day, everybody. Talk to you later. So long. Uh, bye bye. <laughs>